Ranga, Good evening. So we've been looking at uh, last week at the, um, the trainings that of the practitioner, the trainings that are unique to a practitioner of supreme capacity. Whether one is a practitioner of supreme capacity or not, depends on whether one has generated bodhicitta in one's continuum or not. When one has generated bodhicitta, then thereafter all the virtue that one accumulates becomes virtue associated with the Mahayana in that that virtue leads to the attainment of the goal of the Mahayana Dharma, Buddhahood itself. To generate bodhicitta this comes about in dependence on a number of causes. It's immediately preceded by the uh, generation of the altruistic attitude of universal responsibility. To generate such a mind comes, uh, is done through two methods, which can be combined in one. The one method is the six causes and one effect method, and the second is that of equalizing and exchanging self with others. Last week, we uh, looked in brief at the varying stages that one goes through in order to generate bodhicitta. And in particular, we looked at the, um, how to train one's mind so as to develop a sense of closeness to others, so that whomever one calls to mind, one has a, a pleasant feeling towards them, a tender attitude towards them, whomever they are. And with such a, a close and tender attitude, one develops this, rec recognizing this um, intimate relationship, this entwined relationship that one has had across lifetimes, and that this relationship has been marked in, in so many instances of them directly showing kindness, as well as directly and indirectly um, their activities have been of great benefit to us leading to the generation to repay the, uh, the, the generation of the thought to repay the kindness and benefit that that these kind tender mother beings have shown us since beginningless time and these are the um, indispensable prerequisites for generating love and compassion which are required in order to generate the altruistic attitude and bodhicitta itself and in the other you name Menga, didn't you go near Lucha Vision by Teda, Tashan Yam Jagone, Tai Lucha Vision by Nidi, Tashan Yam Jagone, Luchang and the Umpu Numboruch, Umpu Nobor, Ntop Chewar, Chagore, and this Umpu Nomad, that Dine, and then you name Menga, didn't you go near 
between these two methods, some will be more drawn to the six cause and one effect method, and others will be more drawn to the uh, equalizing and exchanging self for others method. One would be encouraged to practice whatever, uh, wherever one is, is, is most inclined. But it's said that the practitioner um, who's drawn towards equalizing, exchanging self for others requires a far greater strength of mind, a more courageous attitude to embark on that particular method of training. <laughs> Jimmy The, the training in the six causes and one effect method starts with a, the, uh, the indispensable prior cultivation of equanimity. So the, the uh, equanimous or impartial attitude is generated or needs to be generated even prior to cultivating the first of the six causes that leads to the one effect, namely bodhicitta. The impartial attitude is an indispensable foundation coming to recognize all beings as being equal in, in, in value and deser deserving of the attainment of state of, of lasting happiness, a sense of um, uh, 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 getting rid of one's uh, tendency to feel closer to some and distant from others, but rather having an impartial and equal attitude towards all. And here, only when this mind of equanimity is quite stable and developed within oneself, is one ready to engage if in effective meditation on the first of the six causes, which is to recognize that across lifetimes, these innumerable lifespans and immeasurable life forms over an inconceivable span of time that we've shared uh, with beings, that they have all, certainly more than once, been our parent, our kind mother, and this then needs to be cultivated again and again until it too, this first of the six steps, which is based on equanimity, becomes stable. Once it too is stable, then one is ready to move to the next step, reflecting on the kindness of that beings have shown us directly and indirectly. And this too then is emphasized, uh, uh, this, then this becomes the as the emphasis in our meditation, recalling the kindness. And here, like with the preceding steps, when this is stable within us, we are then ready to effectively meditate on generating the wish to repay the kindness. So here, the key point I'm emphasizing in the training in the six causes and one effect is a sequence. And what the meditator recognizes that they are ready to move to the next step once um, some stability in, in the realization of the, the current step has been attained. Then they are ready to focus on the next step of the meditation. 
Moving through these uh, steps, recalling the kindness, generating the wish to repay the kindness, that, that, then these, and these preceding steps are indispensable for the generation of love and compassion in this, this technique. So those are the foundational meditations which need to be effectively cultivated before one can actually generate compassion and love for beings. ランチェバチンブロダシェンチェバチンブロニディパシェンチェバチンブロニディパシェンチェバチンブロニディパシェンチェバチンブロニディパシェンチェバチンブロニディパシェンチェバチンブロニディパシェンチェバチンブロニディ
if one thinks to oneself, if a practitioner striving to generate body uh, uh, body cheetah knows they need to generate compassion, and between these two methods, they focus solely on equalizing and exchanging self with others, will they be able to generate compassion? The answer would be yes. So this practitioner will be focusing of the two methods only on the one, not engaging in the six cause and one effect method, and they would be able to generate compassion. So therefore one may think, oh well, between the two I hear that the um, equalizing and exchanging self with others is done by the more courageous practitioner and I've just heard that focusing just on that, not doing the reflections on six cause and one effect will lead to the generation of compassion, then maybe I should just do that. これ、so whilst it is correct that compassion can be new, uh, generated by a practitioner who solely focuses on equalizing and exchanging self with others and ignores the six cause and one effect method, whilst they will be able to generate compassion, they will actually take longer to do so than if they had uh, uh, first cultivated or, uh, the steps of um, or those foundational cause, uh, steps of six or within the six causes, namely equanimity, uh, recognizing beings as one's mother, uh, uh, the, the rec recognizing the kindness and the wish to, uh, to generate, uh, repay that kindness. If one, if that practitioner had rather meditated on those four steps and then equalizing and exchanging self for, uh, for others, they are most likely, or very likely, almost certain, to generate compassion more quickly. <laughs> Mare, 
Two people need to climb a ladder. The first person is quite tall and strong. They will be able to race up the ladder, skipping perhaps every uh, second or even uh, skipping two steps at a time and go up the ladder very quickly because they've got longer legs and, and stronger. Then the much shorter person behind them, wanting to copy them, would they be able to or not? Hmm. Yes, but with a bit more difficulty. They'd have to hold on very tight, they'd have uh, to the sides of the ladder and have to take uh, the, each step quite carefully because they're skipping out one or two, two rungs on the ladder as they try and emulate the person who's got uh, uh, longer legs and perhaps stronger than they are. So they would be able to emulate the person but they'd have some difficulty and end up climbing, taking longer to climb the ladder. And the next day, so so you come down, move down, so so you on board down, and the car is tumbling, and then tumbling, then you go, you go, you go, and you go, so 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 you, you know, 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 Similar illustration would be if some heavy perhaps luggage or sacks need to be carried from one place to another. And if someone tries to do it in one go and picks everything up, maybe they'll make it, they'll be a bit tough. Whereas if they'd done it in two trips, they could have done it a lot easier without exhausting themselves. So thinking of these illustrations then, the key point is that of these methods, one should do what fits with one's own a karmic background and individual spiritual disposition. Knowing oneself, looking clearly or clear-eyed clear, clear at oneself, go with the method that feels uh, uh, most comfortable for you, because for you, you'll proceed more quickly. So don't, don't necessarily follow the method that you hear sounds more, uh, is the better one to do. Rather, what sits better with your own disposition your own inclination, because acting in uh, following that inclination, you'll have less obstacles and you'll proceed more quickly, generate compassion more quickly. On that, that didn't much yet in my dashing MG, you go near that you go to Chanjusim Giagi, dashing MG, you not in my shoe, some chagore, to that in that in my city, Dungal Tramont Zamia, Midwichi, Della Namia. Choshe Meberni, Dada and Shen like Keber Yemeshe, Shen the Kawaki or Chingilo of Sesh. Tonight, then, we're going to continue with the 90th verse, which is uh, particularly on equalizing and exchanging self with others. Please bless me to enhance the bliss and joy of others, realizing that there is no difference between us. None of us desires the slightest suffering or is ever content with the happiness we have. <laughs> This verse condenses vast teachings. If you look, for example, at the teachings on this text in a text like the Great um, Stages of the Path to Enlightenment, the Lamrim Chemo, that it will be covered over many, many pages. Here we have a verse. So, utilizing this verse then, 
first point to make is the sequence of training. So we know this tra training's title is Equalizing and Exchanging Self with Others. And that is the sequence of, of the practice. First one trains in equalizing and thereafter in exchanging. Kunzukangadile, Ning now, even before we look at the verse, I want to make one thing clear, because there's a common misapprehension, misunderstanding, when reading the title of this practice, equalizing and exchanging self with others. Because it sounds like somehow we have to swap oneself for, for someone else, which seems a little bizarre. So one needs to understand this, the title of the practice from the outset so as to present, uh, prevent confusion and pre prevent obstacles to wanting to engage in this practice from arising. So in brief, what we are aiming to do is not swap myself for someone else, but swap an attitude for another attitude or exchange one attitude for, an, for another attitude. This is what we are wanting to exchange. So we start by recognizing, on a, 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 coming to, to reflect on a dominant attitude within ourselves. We could almost say it is pervasive within us. Coming to recognize, recognize its role that it plays in our life and has so life after life and the great harm that follows from this. That's the starting point. And this attitude is the, it's usually called a self-cherishing mind or self-cherishing attitude, more uh, ex um, uh, directly translated, will be grasping at oneself as dear. So this is the attitude which puts one's own wish for happiness first and foremost, including at the expense of others. And to express that in its companion way, one's own, putting one's own wish to avoid, to be free of suffering, first and foremost, including at the expense of others. Here we need to look clearly at ourselves and recognize how, whilst generally we do care for the welfare of others, we do, though, tend to put our wishes first. And if to achieve our wishes of attaining happiness, of having things go our way, 
or of averting suffering, repelling others and the wishes of others, we will do so and we will justify that. We will justify the direct or indirect harm that comes to others because of our own self-interest being first and foremost. And then the, an illustration the text would present would be if you think of the way that farming used to be done, still done in some countries, but used to be done um, around the world where um, animals or beasts of burden were, were utilized. So a farmer wanting to have a bountiful crop would beat and t uh, abuse their, um, their ox, pulling the plow with no regard to that animal just thinking about the benefit that will come by getting the fields, a large fields planted quickly. So there, their own, the farmer's own self-interest is first and foremost. He may well include his near and dear, his family, their self-interest, but the being that is being beaten and abused won't be considered. And even if it is, the beatings the abuse, abusing behavior will be justified. So take that and reflect on how we live our own lives. This is then what we want to abandon. What we want to exchange it for is the directly opposite attitude. Abandon grasping at oneself as dear and exchange it for holding others as dear, the other cherishing mind, holding others as dear. And this is the, done through re reflecting on the, the benefits of the other cherishing mind, generating a close and warm attitude towards others, a tender attitude towards them, valuing them, valuing them more than, than one's own happiness. So this is the meaning of this practice, equalizing and exchanging self with others, where one is exchanging one attitude for another attitude. Oh,那你那些人本来啊，这个大有大有大，这么几千多学校的话，就是让接不起来，让这个阿拉给这个阿姨当不起的，阿姨当我全部的，我也不明确，我当阿姨也不差个什么别的，说让接不起来，大家学
So here, in this illustration, there are two things that need to be exchanged. The first is to be very sure that we see that any harm that, co that, harm that comes to others through our endeavors is not to be justified. It is rather to be averted through valuing others. And the second key point from this reflection, from this illustration, is to take this attitude or the strength of mind that is focused on achieving goals that are in my own self-interest and keep that strength of mind but change the, the, the self-interest aspect to being interested in the welfare of others. So the same strength of mind that one perhaps has brought to success in various aspects of one's life that strength of mind, if well applied, is a great quality. But the goal needs to be the welfare, the benefit of others. And then when one strives, clearly no, one will not ignore the harm that comes to others because their benefit is first and foremost. I <laughs> Yam chase it at Yamba, Dangbon Yamba, Yam chase, Dangbon Yamba come here, see what I did my answer to Tashin Yamba come here, Kishigore. Says that Dunga Tramoza and Biduchin said, and Ranzo, Dunga Miduba, Dunga Chimbu in there, Ranshan, Ranshan Daddy in there, Dunga Chimbu in that Dugo Mare, Dunga Chunju in that Chimbu, Ranzu in that, Sosu in that Dunga Chimbu Dugo Mares. Dima said, Dunga Chunju or Chine, Dunga Tramos and Dead, Dunga Chunju or just going on to Gamba de Wadina. Jigbare Now to turn directly to the text. The first line in the Tibetan is our third line. None of us desires the slightest suffering. So it's very clear that in the practice of equalizing and exchanging self with others, this line is to do with equalizing, the starting point of this training. Here we recognize how we react to any discomfort, no matter how slight that whether it's physical or mental, if it's physical discomfort, maybe um, a, a stone in one's shoe, or um, slight mental unease, slight boredom, whatever it may be, we tend to immediately react, trying to get rid of this physical discomfort or this mental uh, displeasure. We immediately respond. Here we recognize that our dislike for even slight discomforts is not unique. It's shared by all beings. We are all the same in this way. None of us want to suffer, suffer even in the slightest of ways. Ah, Dene. Tanga Jesus and Betadina Mosa Begay, the Nessam Chosho Marcasina Corre, Deva de Casignona, Nanzulu Nungu, Shane Chibares, Shane, Coronto Deva Casignona, Deva Sajena, Kioana, Same Deva, and the Chig Deva Chishun Kanishine, Deva de Kidina, the Nungu, the Coronto Yungu, the Tanga Jesus with Chosha Kayamades. Chisanda Sosu in there, Chibar was, Chisan Randa and Shenigal, the Devalaya, Ganesh Chishun Kanishine. で、では、で、もう少し、だ、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、が、
the second line in the Tibetan, our fourth line, it builds clearly on what we've just looked at, or is ever content with the happiness we have. Again then, we need to look at how this is true for ourselves. How throughout this life, every pleasure that we've experienced and enjoyed, we have, it has never been enough. Firstly, it passes. Then we want either the same or better again. We yearn for past pleasures. And even when enjoying a pleasure, we hope for something better next time. We've, we're never satisfied, never content with what we have. We always look for more. The pleasures we've known have never satisfied us. But this too is not, not unique to me. Others are like this too. I see them, like me, striving always for more, for bigger, better, for more. Never satisfied, never enough. So these two lines, so for us the third and the fourth line, we need to reflect on them together, seeing how we are, seeing ourselves with honesty, and then recognizing, and I'm no different from others, we are all the same in these ways. None of us wants to suffer. None of us is happy with the happiness we've experienced. Mm -hmm. That's what we've looked at in the third and fourth line is summarized in for us the second line realizing that there is no difference between us this then is the, the conclusion we are all the same none of us is wants to suffer in any way any harm that arises in any way, physical or mental, none of us want this. Even slight discomforts, slight mental unease, we immediately act to dispel it. And so too with happiness. Whether, certainly with slight, but even the greatest of happiness, happinesses, lacking a developed mind, a content mind, we never satisfied. We always want at least as good as we've had, again, preferably better. So in this way, we really are all the same. <coughs> Dunga <laughs> Top 
Pene the meditation here is clearly an analytical meditation. Here, it's, a, it's, a, it's particularly suited to both meditation and outer meditation, watching your own mind, seeing where how, uh, how we respond to unwanted situations, and how we we act so as to have what, uh, things go our way, to have what we want. Watch one's own mind. And then, in each instance where one sees this, apply it to others, recognizing, I'm not particularly bad because I'm like this. Actually, others are like this too. We are all the same. And conversely, when you see in others how they react to unwanted situations or how they strive to have things go their way, to get what they want, recognize that in others and then look for it in oneself, breaking down the barrier between self and others. Here we're trying to break down this sense of my welfare first and foremost, or when we, at our best, myself and my group, or, and then, Others, but only if I have an abundance. This we're trying to break down, to see that there really is no valid basis to discriminate between self and others in this way. So that's where we need to come to as the, con as the conclusion of this meditation, is to again and again recognize that we are the same. We all want happiness. So for example, just like I want to be treated with respect and kindness, so too do others. Just like I want my needs to be heard and acknowledged, so too do others. Just like I do not like to be taken advantage of, nor do others. So therefore, when I interact with others, I cannot put my needs before theirs. We both need to feel acknowledged and respected in this relationship. I cannot put my needs ahead of theirs. I cannot take advantage of them just to get my own way. They want to be happy just like I do, and their happiness is not less important than my own, whomever they are. That is the conclusion we come to by equalizing how we see ourselves and others, or our group and others. Is ダンヨムロワタディチクバセダンヨムロワチザダンヨムゴンバディヨムドゴロワデチザセムジェタムジェデワミドゴミドバイマチクバセムジェタムジェデワデバイマチクバランダシェンチャザンキャブラメバチク
uh, none of us want to suffer and none of us are content with the happiness that we have. All of us, every pleasant experience we've had, we long to have it again and hopefully better than before. There's no contentment for, amongst us. And here the key point is to see we are the same as others like this. And therefore, just like I want things to go my way, just like I want to have my needs fulfilled, so too do others. So therefore, I need to help them fulfill their needs. I need them to have, help others have their wishes fulfilled. Because their happiness is important. I cannot say that my happiness is superior to theirs. My need for happiness, rather, is superior to theirs. So reflecting with both in, in uh, terms of both suffering and happiness, in this way, we come to see, firstly, that we are all the same in wanting happiness and never being content with what we have, wanting to avoid suffering, even the slightest. And therefore, I cannot justify adding to the pain of others, nor can I justify not helping them achieve happiness. Because in the same way as I strive for my own happiness, because I value happiness, others value happiness too. I must help them achieve happiness. And in the same way I strive to avoid suffering, because I don't want to suffer in even a slight way, nor do others. And therefore, wherever I can, I need to help others avoid suffering, even slight suffering. So this comes from developing an impartial and equanimous attitude, seeing all of us as being equal. ジバ、ジバ、タバテンボチナシェンケジジバヤマレ。シェンタバテンボチソソソケジケジマジジバディヤマレ。チザランジャチャザ、ギュナンケンレテネキヤワジバダ。アネコケジケジジジロバジバマ
how I, our experiences are impermanent. The self, oneself and others are all changing momentarily. What we experience is changing momentarily. So here we take the, the reflection a little deeper, reflecting on subtle impermanence in terms of oneself, um, beings are impermanent, oneself, others are impermanent. Our experiences also change momentarily. And another subtler level to reflect on is that both the happiness we desire and the suffering we long to be freed of come about in dependence on causes. And those causes one can look at the coarser causes that are, are manifestly visible, but important to look at the subtler causes, namely our karma. And our karma is largely contaminated in that it's been accumulated under the influence of the afflictions. And this, so what we're doing here is again building on our understanding of, ex, of equalizing by seeing how we are all the same in these subtler understandings. So what's not so um, manifestly obvious. So we're reflecting on subtle impermanence. We're reflecting on dependency, dependency on causes, that things arise from karma, and that karma is, is contaminated by the role of the afflictions. And we, this is the case for all of us. So this reflection on a subtler level is to further remove the possibility of discriminating between holding oneself as superior, as, as more dear than others. So here we take the level, the, the meditation to a subtler level. <laughs> Nigga Meditation, then, we can look at it on, on equalizing through two general stages. The first, was looking in terms of suffering and happiness on a coarser level, and then looking at suffering and happiness on a subtler level, taking into account subtle impermanence, that um, both happiness and suffering arise in dependence on causes, those cause, and looking at how karma dominates uh, ourselves as well as others, as do afflictions, self and other. So here, we're breaking down this differentiation, this discrimination we make between ourselves and others. Because these differences that we observe that result in us prioritizing ourselves 
first and foremost, our own happiness and freedom from suffering first and foremost, are created by our self-interest. When we look at it more clear-eyed, we see there really is no reason to put ourselves before others. There is no good reason for this. Now I'll introduce an analogy, an analogy that you can use in your meditation. Think of two animals of any kind that are commonly uh, eaten by, by humans, and they are both being um, held in container in, in a single container, perhaps in an iron cage, and uh, by a butcher. Both of them are waiting to, to be slaughtered. You have these two animals in this confined space, smelling, sensing the impending butchering. Afflictions will be strong. Fear will be strong. When we look at their situation, it's clearly awful, it's pitiful. Because of the dominance of the afflictions in their mind, they may well fight, turn on each other, desperate for freedom. From a wiser perspective, we can see that's pointless. They're both in an awful situation. They both long to be liberated from the pain of their situation. Conflict is senseless. That illustration is very clear. Now apply it to ourselves and the people in our lives now and who have been and who will be. This is our situation. We are all trapped in samsara with death bearing down on us and are helpless to free ourselves from this situation of unwanted death over which we have no control over. And at that time, all that we have so crave, craved in this world and longed for in this world and uh, fought and, and struggled to achieve will all be left behind. And we'd wonder then, what was all that conflict for? What was all that striving and self-interest about? How pointless it was. Here we rather recognize all of us trapped in this awful situation of samsara, bound by these chains of the afflictions. We are in the same situation for the same reason, with the same jailer. There is no difference between us. Why have conflict? Why not help others? Why not help those who are particularly blind to the situation? So in this way, we see how equal we are that there is no basis for discrimination. There's no basis to put our needs first. There's no basis for harming others. There's no basis for pushing our wants and our happiness first. We are really all in the same situation. <laughs> Good Tendigin 
Padoriadi, Mindua, Chesa, Randa, Soso, sometimes, Soso, Rang Lagor, Mission, Shen Lagor, Chesa, Soso, Randa, Shen, Niga, Chatu, and Chagurua, Chesa, Shen, said, Los Doria, Mindua, Chesa, Randa, Shen, and Cabra, Mid, Chibar, it was, Chesa, do sometimes, Rash and Cabra, Mabba, Chen, Mabba, and Zada, Shen, said, Los of Tenche, Shanja, Nebuchia, Shanja, Kamatia, Shanja, Duma, Matia, Jimmy, Chesa, Tinza, Randa, Shen, Cabra, Mindus, and Bedusinda, Rashin, Cabra, Mabba, the Nyamba, Yimba, Dusan. I've presented two levels of subtlety, the first being coarse, uh, looking at how none of us desires the slightest of suffering or is ever content with the happiness we have, and then taking that to a subtler level, reflecting on, on subtle impermanence, on uh, uh, depend dependency in terms of causes, in particular uh, uh, karma and, and the afflictions. Then there's the subtlest level to take the reflection to, to take the reflection to, so as to really radically break up this dis uh, discriminating this habit of discriminating between self and others, which results in us justifying our own self-interest first and foremost. So the subtlest level in looking at the practice of equalizing and exchanging self with others is to look at the self. How does the self, the I, appear? Then investigate to see if it exists in the way that it appears or not. And one comes to recognize the self is empty of existing in the way that it appears exists merely imputed by mind. Others, here, yeah, how do they occur to mind? An individual, a group? And when we investigate, do they exist in the way they appear? We'll find they too do not exist in the way they appear. They're empty of existing in the way they appear, but exist merely labeled by mind. So here we come to recognize that on an ultimate level, a level of ultimate analysis, when one looks for the ultimate or final way of abiding, of existing, there is no difference between myself and others. We are empty of existing in the way they appear, we appear, exist, and we exist conventionally, merely labeled by mind. No self-existent person, whether oneself or other, can be found. And not only that, but any situation or desire or hope that one is either wants to have or repel, how does that appear? Can it be found? It too is empty. If we're desiring something, pulling it forward or repelling it, we're desiring an illusion in that it does not exist in the way that it appears. And you can reflect on this through the analogy of near and far, thinking how, from my perspective, I am near and others are far. From each individual's perspective, they will make the same conclusion. And if it's two people, 
looking at each other, they will both feel that they are near and the other is far. Whereas that's not possible. And a person cannot be both near and far. So ultimately, one is neither near nor far, but conventionally, one can be labeled as both near or far, depending, depending on the perspective of who does the labeling. What's important with this reflection is we see that, say, for example, oneself, that one views as near, is also conventionally, validly labeled as far by someone else, which shows that one only exists as near or far in dependence on being labeled, which comes about in dependence on a perspective. So applying this to other situations, we realize that perspe perspectives can change. Even near and far is relative. Take this then to all that comes to mind. Anything that seems like a reason to justify a difference, see how it does not exist in a, the final analysis from its own side, but merely labeled by mind and therefore from a perspective. And that can be changed. And the purpose of this meditation brings us further, uh, once again, to that same conclusion, enhancing, enforcing the same conclusion. There is no valid way to justify, justify placing my needs before the needs of others. There's no valid way to justify harming others in any way, no matter how slight, for my own benefit. This is the outcome of this meditation too. Ah,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,对你个,
Dasen Jamini Jukomi Yahoo, you had a lamichin la Rosia said, Yasul Jesu Sugar Wada. There was a nigger, what the Chasan studio, what the Chasan studio. Here in this meditation I, I, I just outlined, we come to see that there really is no difference between self and other. We are both the same in that we appear, whether self or other appears as being truly existent, but when one investigates, one finds both the self and others <laughs> do not exist in the way they appear. And both self and others are also the same in being merely labelled by mind. So every step here, we can remind ourselves of, of that we are all the same. So I've mentioned three differing levels of subtlety in this meditation. And I'm confident that you have the Dharma knowledge to engage in all three of these. And doing them together will deepen one's understanding of this topic, breaking down the sense of differentiation with others. Now I'll bring a fourth level. Because we've ended up to now at the third level, recognizing, uh, uh, reflecting on emptiness, which concludes with recognizing a uh, dependency on labeling by mind. So that third level of the meditation ends with reflecting on dependence arising. Here we reflect in our the fourth level further on dependence arising. Firstly, the self, which exists merely labeled by mind, is mu mutually dependent on others. We can only talk about oneself if it is in reference to others. And likewise, other people are in the same situation, that they can only talk about themselves in relation to there being others. So this is the same reflection, or way of thinking, as reflecting on near and far. And then we take it now to a whole new area, reflecting on dependent arising through the interdependent relationship we have with others. This is crucial. Because in this equalizing meditation, we are trying to overcome the sense of isolation, of separation from others, through valuing all as, as equal. So here we reflect in this fourth level on the interdependent relationship we have with others. That we have this life in this realm, in this body, is dependent on others. First and foremost, we recall our parents, independence on our parents, we were born. In dependence on our parents and so many others, we were nurtured when we were vulnerable. We were nurtured and sustained as we grew. This was all in dependence on the kindness, the direct kindness of others, as well as their beneficial um, uh, activities, as well as the indirect activities of others that benefited us. Those who are unknown to us and we are unknown to them in this life, their labor benefits us. So too, the education that we've received. All our knowledge has come about in dependence on others, either being taught directly, um, uh, information imparted to us, or being trained how to think critically. If we were remained completely un uneducated, our level of knowledge and self-awareness and insight be grossly undeveloped. Further, we reflect that all good qualities of the Dharma that we have within us and we will still at attain come about in dependence on others. And not just the, the obvious ones, such as spiritual teachers, but far more broadly than that. Certainly, the generation of definite emergence, love and compassion. Bodhicitta enlightenment come about in dependence on initially a vast number of beings and then eventually all sentient beings. So in this way, 
we come to recognize our interdependent relationship with others. Coming to see again and again that there is no difference at both, at both a conventional nor at a, uh, at a conventional level that we can use to discriminate and to put ourselves before others. And certainly when we bring in the ultimate analysis, looking at, at reality, seeing that other than being labeled differently on an ultimate level, no difference can be found. This then leaves the mind vast and expansive, open to all as being equal. And this opens us up to the generation of love because of the tender, close feeling we feel for, these, for all beings due to this interdependent relationship we have. So in this way, love and compassion arise readily within us. And this then brings us to, in this meditation, to the final line of the verse, which in English is, is our first line. Please bless me to enhance the bliss and joy of others. So we turn to our Lama, who we recognize as indivisible from the Buddha and Yidam, for his inspiration, his blessings, that we can enhance the, um, the bliss Bliss here we understand as both being worldly happiness as well as the happiness of generating paths in their mind that we may enhance both the worldly and transworldly bliss and happiness as well as joy of others. We take blessing and inspiration from our lamas. <laughs> Dungan Chisanta We've gone a little over tonight, I apologize, but this is such an important meditation. Just to summarize then the steps of the meditation. Most, as you've heard, this is, as usual, an analytical meditation. And as usual, as you're going through the various steps, as a feeling arises at the, during the various stages, then briefly stop your analytical meditation and abide, gauge in placement meditation. Abide with each individual result as one goes through the meditation, alternating, as I've described um, in detail in previous weeks, between analytical and placement meditation. So one 
starts with a coarser level of reflection, which we have had in the, the lines. None of us desires the slightest suffering or is ever content with the happiness we have. So I'm saying here this is a coarser level of reflection, but I encourage you, don't skip, skip over any of these steps. Dwell on all of them, because the subtler steps come about in dependence on a transformative understanding of the prior steps. So reflect on them all well, seeing how we all want happiness, and we strive and turn towards um, every form of happiness we can attain. And likewise, we don't want to suffer even in the slightest of way and do, do all we can to overcome suffering. We are all the same. And then move to the subtler level, that self and other are subtly are, are impermanent, changing momentarily. There is no difference between us. Self and other change momentarily. Our physical and mental aggregates are impermanent. They change momentarily. We are all the same there. We have better days and worse days. We, on a subtler level, reflect on subtle impermanence. Also, that what we experience, what we long for, and what we long to attain and long to um, uh, be free from, arises in dependence on causes and conditions. And those causes include the afflictions which cause our pain and bind us in samsara. We are all the same. And then reflect on the subtlest level. How does the self appear? How does do others appear? How do individual situations, desires and wants appear? Do they exist in the way they appear? And we recognize they do not. And here in particular reflect on that I can, uh, on, on here and there, that I have the feeling I am here, separate from others, distinct from others. This cannot be found through final analysis, the ultimate analysis. In fact, it exists merely dependent on labeling by mind. It's only from a perspective I can validly say, I am here and others are there. But it's only dependence on labeling that this can be said. It's from a perspective. And then this apply this to other understandings, because perspectives can be changed. We can label things validly in differing ways, good and bad, and so forth. And then go to the fourth level, which is that of interdependence, recognizing how all our happiness has come about independence on others, how we are deeply reliant on others. In the previous step, we looked at the delusion of independence. Here, we are reflecting on the fourth level at our interdependence, how all the happiness we have experienced has come about independence on others, reflecting on our parents and more broadly. But so too is our future bliss. That too is dependent on others. All the good qualities we've developed in our mind, this happiness has come from others, and as we develop into paths, the, and that bliss comes about independence on others. In this way we break down the separation of self and others. We break away, eliminate this feeling of superiority, self-obsession, self-interest. We conclude the meditation with the determination to break down the separation and to act with this wisdom that we have generated and the arising love and compassion for others. And take that same strength of mind that we've thus far applied to achieving our own interest and utilize that now as an asset. Utilize the strength of mind, this courageous attitude that saw us strive through hardships. Apply it to achieving the happiness of others. Apply it to helping others overcome suffering. So that's the meditation, primarily analytical, but alternate with placement. And I encourage you to do this regularly. Transformation then will come. Thank you. Thank you all very much.